The most important aspect of preparation is attention to curb appeal. Curb appeal is a big deal. Industry studies say in the real estate business that 71% of buyers will make a decision from the curb. They will buy the house from the curb and they'll go in just to make sure there's the right number of bedrooms. How it looks from the street is huge. And if it's ugly from the street, even if it's great on the inside, they're never coming in. You can't get them in. And curb appeal is a big deal. So go stand in the street and ask yourself, what is wrong with this picture? And look at it. What have I got to do? We've got to edge the sidewalk. We've got to have fresh mulch. The bushes need to be trimmed. I'm amazed at what you can do to get a house ready to sell. I bought a house back when I was doing rehabs, and it's actually not far from this location right here. And it was a, an old house built back in the 70s, a big old long ranch house, but it had this 25-year-old bushes that were overgrown and trying to eat the house. It was the bushes that ate the house. Those old bagworm bushes with bagworms on them. Blah, big old bushes. Ugly. And I thought, I wonder if there's a house behind this foliage. Now, this wasn't a fine, nice oak tree. These were trash shrubs that nobody trimmed in 25 years. You understand the difference? So I said, I got the guys with the chainsaw. I said, all of it. Take it all out. Take it all out. We're going back with small, nice stuff. Man, I'll tell you what. We cut that stuff down. There was a pile of brush the size of a house we were done to get rid of. And, and we called it off before I got back over there. And it was just, you know, it was down to the dirt. And we were getting ready to go back. When I drove up to this house that I had bought, I missed it. I drove past. It looked so different. The thing visually had grown 10 or 15 feet in length because it wasn't overgrown with bushes. The curb appeal completely changed on this house. There was actually a beautiful home back there. And we put a coat of paint on the outside and put some beautiful landscaping around it, small, and this big, beautiful ranch home was there all of a sudden, and it changed the curb appeal. So look at that. Think about it. When you're walking up the sidewalk, go, go, in, your, go in the client's mind and, and do the walk. In other words, I'm going to buy this home. I'm going to come look at it with a real estate agent. I'm going to drive up in the driveway. Where am I going to park? When I park there, what am I going to see? Oh, that fence is broken. Oh, look, that gutter's out of line. That's what I'm going to see when I get out, isn't it? When I get out, I'm going to walk down the sidewalk, right? Is it edged? Or is there stuff growing in big cracks in there? And when I walk up on the front porch, while they're, they have to stand there quite a while to get the little key box and all this other stuff or to get the key out and you get the thing. They're standing there a little while. This is your first impression on a job interview. You're about to miss the job. If, that, if you paint anything, paint your front door. Fresh coat of paint on the front door. It, it, little things like that, if you think like a marketer, will cause your home to not only sell faster but sell for more. When selling your home these days, you have to make sure it's listed on the Internet. As a matter of fact, I might tell you to just put a circle around that, stars all around that thing, more than just list it on the Internet. The Internet is so important in retailing real estate today. Back in 1995, only 2% of Americans used the Internet to look at houses. Now 77% say they look at the Internet before they go look at the house. 71% said the sign in the yard and the curb appeal got them. 77% are already saying the internet. And you know what the internet is? That's going to be the picture, right? Or pictures, or lots of pictures, or stuff like iPix where you can do a full 360 of the room. And what are they going to see? They see kitty? I don't want to see kitty in this picture. <laughs> I want to see better homes and gardens in this picture, don't I? I want to see a model home in this picture. And if your realtor that you're working with is not internet savvy in how to prepare the listing and show it on the internet, then you're going to miss it. Because I can tell you, I look at properties and an agent sends it to me with a link back to a website. I click the link, things open up, I get a plot plan, I get exterior views, I get interior views, and the people that are crummy with their pictures, you may never even open up the link because you got that first picture on there and it'll blow it. So all of a sudden, photography becomes a lot of the marketing and how you lay the thing out on the internet and are they internet savvy, this is gonna make a lot of difference. So make sure your pictures are excellent. It is a big deal in marketing a piece of real estate these days. When selling a home, statistical research has found that the best realtors are worth more than they cost unless you're a seasoned pro. 
If you're a seasoned pro, you might be able to sell your own home. But almost every case, you are much better off to use a high-quality, high-octane, high-protein realtor. As a matter of fact, the studies say you will get 16% more for your house on average. Last year, the statistics say this, that the average home in North America with a realtor sold for $230,000 and the average home without a realtor sold for $198,000. 16% difference. They are worth what they cost if they're good. Now, I've got to tell you about realtors. They're like any other business. 80% of them do 20% of the business. 20% of them do 80% of the business. So you want the 20% that are tail kickers, that get business done. And you'll see them. they got lots of signs in your neighborhood. They know what they're doing. And when you meet them, they're very professional. They have a clue. They present themselves. They, they know how to interface with humans. They know how to handle relationships and get things done and move things through a very difficult transaction, which selling a home these days is. And, of course, you want them to use the exposure through the multiple listing service. Now, the multiple listing service is simply the computer system that the realtors use that all of the real estate that, the, that is listed with a realtor is put into that system. And these days, it's all web-based, and again, the realtor can go to the web, and in some places, you can go to the web and just look at what's on the market. And you go, oh, I want that one. And then you can open up and look at the pictures and do the whole thing. Or they'll send you a link back into their MLS system and let you see that one, that one site there with that property. So you need the exposure when you're retailing a piece of property to the most people. Listen, if, if you can expose your house to 10,000 people and I can expose your house to 10 people, who's going to get the most money for the house? You, the guy with 10,000. And, and who's going to sell the house quicker? The guy with 10,000. And who's most likely to sell the house, period? The guy with 10000 So the more, the more eyeballs that know your house is available, the better your deal is going to go down as a seller. And that's why using a realtor and using the MLS is worth the trouble if you get a good one. When selecting a realtor, do not rely on friendships or relatives. Well, my, my Aunt Sally just got in the business, and she just passed her test after the 14th try. And I just would feel guilty if I let someone handle my largest asset if it wasn't Aunt Sally. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands of dollars are placed in a friend who just got in the business hand. Not a chance. The way you look at a realtor is they are a marketing consultant that is paid on commission. If it doesn't sell, they don't get paid. That, it's that simple. And, and so you need to interview them. You need to interview them for the job. If I'm, running my, if I'm doing something at my business and I want to hire a marketing consultant to come in and help us sell something and I'm going to pay them twelve dollars or $20,000, I'm going to interview them. I want to know they've actually done some marketing before in the area that I'm thinking of, that they have some experience, that they have some references, that they have what's known as a clue. And they should be able to come in and do a presentation that shows that they know what they're doing. If I'm going to hire a marketing consultant to sell books for Dave Ramsey, then they ought to be somebody who's sold a book before. A lot. Especially if I'm going to pay them 20 grand to do it. And so well, I just thought I was a marketing consultant, and so I printed up some business cards, and here I am. <laughs> I'm not giving this guy 20,000 bucks. Not a chance. And you don't need to either on your largest asset. It's way way too important. So make sure you get someone. Ask them how many homes they've sold last year. Sold 12 houses. 12 houses, that's one a month. Well, you're eating a lot of donuts, aren't you? One house a month? You're not even eating good in the real estate business. I mean, you used to in the old days, back when I got in the business, if you sold a million dollars worth of real estate, you sold a lot of real estate. You got to sell a million dollars worth to just stay in the business now. And just with the costs and all the expenses that are associated with the business. You know, and, and really a million dollars these days is five, six, seven houses a year. In some areas it's one. You know? It's nothing. I'm in the million dollar club, so that means you're breathing air and got a license. I'm not impressed. I want somebody sold 50, 60, 80 houses, 100 houses, 200 houses in a year. Somebody's cranking it out. Well, they can't give you good attention. Yeah, they can. They're giving a lot of people good attention. Their houses are getting sold. That's what happens. So you want somebody who knows how to kick tail and take names. That's what you're after. Offering a home warranty typically will not make a sale. We used to sell them when I was in the business, but they're really kind of like the extended warranty thing, you know, on appliances. It's, it's this kind of thing where we made all the commission and you got your heating and air system covered. Listen, if you walk around back and the heating and air system looks like an antique, it's because it's an antique. 
you need to take that in consideration when you're buying the house. Now, if they want to come up and ask you to buy a home warranty and you think that's going to cause you to lose the deal, well, buy the stupid home warranty. It's not worth fighting over. But buying one up front and offering it as a marketing technique, it's bogus. won't work. When it comes to buying a home, let's look at this different. Buying a home is a great idea because it's a forced savings plan. As you pay that mortgage off, you have saved money. I mean, if you buy a home for $100,000 and over the years you pay, or $200,000 over the year, you pay it down to nothing, you force yourself to save, even if the house didn't go up in value, you force yourself to save that $200,000. It's an inflation hedge. Now, a lot of you in this room are young enough and watching this are young enough that you haven't really faced real inflation. Inflation for the last couple of decades has been 4 or 5% a year, 3% a year. It's not been a big deal. When I got in the real estate business in 1978, inflation was raging and the real estate in our area was going up 12% a year. And so if we were doing comps on a house that sold three months ago, we had to add a percent a month to the price of it to have an accurate price of what it was selling for now. That's how fast it was moving. So if inflation is up there in double digits, any of you remember back in the 70s when inflation was shooting, skyrocketing? You know, if, if inflation is double digits, the good news is if you own a house, you're part of the ride. If you don't own a home, you're not part of the ride. You're being locked out by inflation. That's a big deal. And, of course, it grows virtually tax-free for most people. Current tax law says if you own your personal residence two years, you can make a profit on it, a gain on it, of up to a half a million dollars, $500,000 if you're married filing jointly, tax-free, up to $250,000 if you're filing as a single person. So it's a great idea. Now, when you're buying a home, always buy title insurance. Title insurance insures you against an unclean title. Now, some people think because they haven't done a lot of real estate deals, they say, well, that's just one of those closing costs. That's just one of those ripoffs. I'm not buying title insurance. The title's not bad. Listen, titles are bad all the time. Title insurance ensures you that if something's messed up in a former transfer of ownership, that that title company has checked that, and they have insured against that, and then if somebody comes back and has a claim, they have to pay them. An example is I owned a piece of property one time that I bought from a guy who had bought from two sisters. And those two sisters owned the house from an estate. Their mom had died. Turns out the two sisters had a brother. He didn't sign off on the house when it was sold, and it wasn't approved by the court through the probate system. And so they didn't have full title transferred to the guy who then sold it to me. Brother's standing around going, I want some money. And I called the title company. I said, brother wants some money. And they paid brother some money. And he signed off on the documents, and, and then we had clean title again. Had he not done that, he really had an honest, he, he, had, a, he had a place here. In this, he's one of those heirs that appears back out of the night. And, the, and these things happen. Well, it doesn't happen. It happens all the time. I had a friend of mine bought a house, and, and the title company had done such a bad job. They had allowed an FHA loan, which is always a first mortgage, to be put on this house, and there was already a mortgage on it. So that means that FHA loan was now a second mortgage. Very unusual. So guess what the first mortgage guy got? Paid off by the title company. He got his money in full from the title company because they had to do that so that that FHA loan was a first mortgage like they had guaranteed the title to be clean to be. And so always buy title insurance. These things really do happen out there in the real world. If the, if the lot is not a standard subdivision lot, if you're buying land in any way, get a survey. Get a survey. Now, I'm from Tennessee, and in Tennessee, we don't have, when you fly over Tennessee, it doesn't look like little checkerboards. When you fly over some parts of the country, it looks beautiful and there's these little perfect squares and everybody knows where their line is because it's all laid out in townships and squares and those kinds of things. In Tennessee, the survey was done from a pile of rocks to an oak tree that died 50 years ago. <laughs> and the pile of rocks is gone too. And, 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 and three or four generations have been stretching the truth about how many acres are in the back field. Until by the time you get back there, you realize that you really have 20 acres and everybody's been telling everybody it was 30 for years. And, and you got ripped. 
because you didn't get a survey. You always get a certified survey unless you're buying a standard subdivision type lot. In that situation, you're pretty protected.